um, and we're delighted to have such a good turnout this evening for this um, Circle Foundation webinar. And it's especially pleasing to have such a strong panel this evening, including um, former Minister Zabeci, Daniel Kaczynski, MP, Yaprak Gorzoi, um, and Sir Dominic Chilcott, who will be joining us, who's the British ambassador um, in Turkey. And I think why this evening is so exciting is that we're now into a new era in British-Turkey relations. And it's a huge opportunity for Britain coming out of the EU to look as a global nation across the world and to be able to forge direct bilateral relations with countries for whom um, sometimes being in the EU has been a bit of an obstacle in being able to develop the relationship we would have wished to develop with countries um, like Turkey. And I'm sure like everyone else, <coughs> I was very, everyone was very pleased um, when um, between Christmas and New Year um, that Britain and Turkey signed a very important UK trade deal, one of the first trade deals demonstrating the strong relationship between both countries and the importance that the UK um, puts on a strong, friendly relationship with one of our most important trading partners. And I think we will discuss trade tonight, um, not least because we're very honoured to have a former Minister of the Economy with us this evening, but also um, we want to discuss the wider relationship with Turkey beyond trade, because there is a huge opportunity for us now to further integrate our interests and to look globally in partnership with Turkey at what we want to do. And this evening, as we witness a new US president and a big change in geopolitics across the world, it provides the backdrop and the opportunity for new partnerships and new interests across the world. And as an ally and a fellow NATO member, our relationship with Turkey and looking at global security and especially the Middle East is going to be one of our key relations as we move forward in terms of security and defence. And I think as well as that, there's also an opportunity for Britain and Turkey to work together on the issues that we both find very important and a very you know, very good and very topical example is the current situation with the Uyghur people in China, where Britain and Turkey, I hope, will be able to take a strong position in defending human rights and campaigning against Islamophobia, wherever it is in the world. And I think that's going to be uh, very important for Britain as we move forward and also for Turkey. So, I'm going to ask each of our speakers this evening uh, to speak for up to 10 minutes, um, and then we will have an opportunity um, for questions. Um, and if I may, the order I will take the speakers is former Minister Zebici first, then Daniel Kaczynski MP, and then um, Yaprak Gorzoi, um, who's also got um, a presentation for us um, so that will be a good way um, to then go into the questions, I think, um, at the end of our presentation. If Sir Dominic joins us, I will take him before Yaprak and then we will um, finish with the presentation. So, first of all, may I ask and say how honoured we are to have with us someone who was at the very height of economic policy in Turkey, is still a very important figure within the AK party and Turkish business. And Minister Zebeci, we are very interested to hear your views and um, outlook on the future British-Turkey relationship post-Brexit. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to you now. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. It's, it's, it's an honour for me to, to have uh, to have the opportunity <clears throat> to be with you tonight. And sorry about my uh, shirt because I'm at home. I see, the, my, I see my colleagues there, my pe the people who has very nice dress and with the ties. Uh, I'm at home, please understand me. Uh, during my 
ministry season, I mean, the, it was the 2016, just after the Brexit, one week after. <clears throat> I, was in, I was in the UK, I was in the London. We had a very important meeting with the uh, minister, Liam Fox, and with the Lord Price. And we decided, and we have seen the, the, the problem after the Brexit, what was going to be, be the trade between UK and the Turkey. <clears throat> and we decided we have to be very quick. We have, we have to be very uh, clever enough to prepare a, the FTA, uh, which, is, which is just initiating and starting just after the Brexit, in the first day of the Brexit, which is just started now. And it, it is started in 2016, and we had a meeting with the Minister the Price with the, with the Lim Fox in Ankara in 2018, I think it was the January. Now the, the result is very successful. I really thanks a lot for those who had, we had very important effort to bring up this agreement. You know, as an as a, uh, ordinary people in Turkey, let's say, as a business people, as a businessman in Turkey, if you ask me which UK I prefer, UK in the European Union or UK in Brexit, UK is, you know, free for as it is now. Honestly, because uh, I'm not minister now, I don't have any responsibilities, I'm an important responsibilities. Even in the party, I'm free. Uh, freely, I tell you, I prefer the UK as it is now. I, 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 it was a very good friend of mine, which is the ambassador, uh, Richard Moore. He was the ambassador that time in Turkey. Just before, a couple of days before the Brexit, we had a dinner in the presidency in, in Turkey, and we were discussing the Brexit, what is going to be happen. I said, you know, the Brexit is going to be the, the UK, the, the British people, they are going to decide to go out from the European Union, and it happened. I don't want to continue on this base because the, the, because if, if, if we see the, the, the UK, United Kingdom, already united, already a kind of unification, Union, uh, the, to, it's, uh, such a uh, country is like United Kingdom. To be in the European Union, it was a kind of conflict. I mean, let me co close this paragraph. Uh, the, the UK is very important country for Turkey for Turkish export. The, the figures in 2019, uh, the, the, almost 12 billion US dollar the export the export was. And almost half of it in import we were doing for we were doing from the UK. I mean, we are doing plus with the, with the UK. Uh, we, 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 even even in the pandemic in, the, in this 2020, we didn't lose so much in the figures. Again, it was 12 to six billion, almost 18 billion trade volume. We kept this. It shows us how strong trade ties between Turkey and the, the UK. But I would like to draw your attention, <clears throat> that as you said, how important potentials we had. And as a normal person, as an ordinary person, as a businessman in Turkey, why the UK is uh, now is becoming more important for Turkey because UK is now free from all ties which is uh, related with the European Union. Now we can do many things together. What? As you said, in Asia, I mean, in Turkic republics, in Middle East, in Africa, in everywhere, we can cooperate Be between countries and even in the companies. I mean, the, the, now the, the FTA, when the UK was in the European Union, we had a, you know, as you, as you know, we have the customs union with the European Union. We were limited with this customs union, which is only the industrial goods, not including agricultural goods, not including the services, not including the public procurements, not including the 
uh, health services, this kind of things was not included in this customs union. It was limited. Now with the UK FTA, we had now starting from the 1st of January, which is a couple of times better than the customs union. In this FTA, we have the incredible opportunities. Now the, the trade is going to is going is, is going to increase in Turkey. And the, I would like the you know the discussion in, in this panel. Uh, we uh, we need to focus on the okay increasing the trade between Turkey and the UK, but cooperation in the third countries, Turkish contractors, con Turkey, Turkish, Turkish contracting construction people, they are second in the world now after China, in, in, in the Middle Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa, in, in Europe, in, in South America, even in the UK, many companies that are now <clears throat> having very, very important projects and Turkish companies, very high volume projects like 5 billion, 10 billion big projects they are doing in all over the world. What is the opportunity I would like to draw your attention is Africa. Africa now, you know, the, uh, uh, under the, uh, I would like, I'm trying to find the, the, the good words, but it's under the uh, invasion of Chinese companies, the Africa, mm -hmm. in all over the Africa. The African countries, good countries have, you know, the enough sources, enough income, you know, or uh, the, 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 they need the infrastructure, they need roads, they need hospitals, they need railways, they need the energy centrals because the electricity in Africa is a really very big opportunity in the future. But the Turkish companies that are there, all, all African countries, you can see the Turkish companies, but we have a Turkish Exim Bank, which is supporting them to have the projects to to, to, do, to, to realize the project in Africa, but Turkish Exim Bank has very limited sources, very limited capabilities. How about the, the, the Turkish and British Exim Banks cooperating together, uh, encouraging the Turkish and British companies doing the projects in Africa, in the Middle East, in, in even, even in the Europe, in, in, in Russia, in, in, in UK, why not? I mean, the, the, we can, the, the, we can, pay attention, we can draw all the attention, politicians or ministers and the finance people, we can draw their, we can draw the attention on this case. On the other hand, is the, you know, the, with the pandemic, we have seen very important, we are we realized very important development. It's not, it's not a development, it was already coming very big wave, E-trade. It's a doubling now. Every year, it, it rate in uh, in itself. It's doubling and coming. The, in, in the future, in coming years, in coming five years, in ten years, most important thing is e trade and the delivery services for the e trade. Turkey and the UK very important position in the world. Now the competition isn't in this delivery speed. The companies, all the brands, all the the sellers, I and mean, the uh, E-trade sellers, retailers, they are saying, okay, but wherever you live in the world, I deliver you in 48 hours, and the competition is going to be in 36 hours, 24 hours, 12 hours, it will continue like this. And the, the, the E-trade financing, E-trade delivery, E-trade e stocking, this kind of the things, which is the very important with the issue for uh, Turkish companies and British companies and Turkish airlines and British airlines, Turkish post services and British post services. I mean, these are the new opportunities because this FTA is had a very, very wide range. I mean, uh, Mark, I mean, the, at the moment, I, the, these are the things I would like to tell you, maybe, maybe with the questions or with the mm -hmm. other audience when they speak, we can continue. No, that's fascinating. Thank you. I think a very strong message there about collaboration between a global Turkey and a global UK. Um, an important point, I'm sure, that will be picked up in the questions. It's delighted that uh, Sir Dominic uh, Chilcott, His Excellency the Ambassador, British Ambassador to Turkey, has joined us. 
and um, to give him time, I will next ask Daniel Kaczynski to speak to us. Daniel, of course, is a trade envoy for Prime Minister Boris Johnson, as well as being a former advisor um, to David Cameron, Prime Minister on Central and Eastern Europe. So an expert on trade and geopolitics. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say, Daniel. Well, thank you very much, Your Lordship. And I will <clears throat> try to get through as much as I can in the, in the minutes I've been allocated. And um, of course, I'm the first ever Polish-born British Member of Parliament. Uh, so I have two horses in this race, two countries that I love, Britain and Poland. Uh, and of course, they both find themselves in very different situations at the moment with regards to the European context. Um, I campaigned for Brexit uh, in a constituency which, which voted for Brexit um, simply because I, in my constituency, and I think it's important to understand this, uh, UKIP, <clears throat> UKIP uh, won the European parliamentary elections not once, but four times overwhelmingly. And when our previous Prime Minister, Mr. Cameron, tried to renegotiate with the European Union to, to um, make them realise that we had real problems with the direction of travel ops organisation, um, those concerns fell on deaf ears. And they were simply not interested in listening to the real problems that our own constituents uh, were raising with us. Whether it's to do with immigration, levels of immigration, whether it's to do with borders and sovereignty, rules and regulations, competitiveness, all of those things. So I campaigned for Brexit, and I'm very proud of that. I think there were many in the British establishment who uh, wanted to do everything conceivable to ensure uh, that we stayed in the, in the European Union. And what I am really proud of, and this is the essential point, from a democratic perspective, and this is important for our Turkish friends. Every time the people of any European country have had the temerity to vote against the European Union, be, be that in Denmark, be that in uh, Holland, be that in France, or be that in Ireland, they've been told, you've made a mistake, naughty. Go back, vote again, and you get it right. And this is the first time in the history of the European Union where people of a certain country have voted against the direction of travel of what they've experienced, in our case, over 48 years, and that decision has been implemented. And so from a sheer, from a democratic perspective, that is a very important step on our continent. I've just come from the 1922 committee, where Liz Truss, which is the weekly session that members of Parliament have with a particular Secretary of State, and addressing us this evening in House of Commons was Liz Truss, the Secretary of State for Trade and Industry. And she explained to us how the United Kingdom has signed this year 63 bilateral free trade agreements, totaling over £900 billion. We were told we were too small we were told we were too inconsequential a country to be able to do these things, that we had to ask and need the European Union in order to do all these trade deals for us. In the history of the world, no country has signed this, this number of free trade agreements in this short period of time. And I'm extremely proud of what our government has managed to do. Liz has also referred to the deal with Turkey uh, in her speech. Over 7,600 British companies trade with Turkey, and this trade agreement that we've just signed with our Turkish allies is worth over £18 billion. When I was on the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, we visited Ankara, and it's the only time in my experience of being on the Foreign Affairs Select Committee where the president of that country actually turned up to meet uh, with the members of the Foreign Affairs Select Normally, if you're on a Foreign Affairs Select Committee, you get to meet the, potentially, depending on the country, the Foreign Secretary or uh, some junior officials. But actually, President Erdogan turned up, spoke to us and gave us a, what can only be described as a two and a half hour PowerPoint presentation on Turkey and the Turkish perspective and the Turkish narrative. It was a very, very interesting evening with President Erdogan, 
and I very much hope to be able to share with you some of the things uh, that we discuss in future. What is the most important thing for me, though, as Polish-born British Member of Parliament, is NATO. And we all know uh, how uh, the threat of certain um, countries uh, to our common security is extraordinarily bound. I think that NATO countries, and as you know, we've just had Northern Macedonia joining, which has made now this exclusive number 30 countries. I think to be a member of NATO is a gold card, it's an exclusive club, and it's extremely important to maintain the supremacy of NATO on our continent. One could do a whole thesis on the importance of Turkey in regard. Uh, protecting our southern flank. And goodness only knows, sometimes think to myself, what would happen to Europe? What would happen to Southeastern Europe if Turkey was not part of NATO and was not a friendly, close, trusted ally of the United Kingdom and of whole NATO partnership? Uh, when we visited Turkey, we, we saw um, the extraordinary amount of um, care and attention and the huge costs involved for the Turkish government of looking after Syrian refugees um, that had fled across the border. I'm very proud that the United Kingdom sent more in international aid to help Syrian refugees in camps in Jordan and Lebanon, but no country in the world has done as much to help uh, it, with the refugee crisis in Syria. So we must work together with our Turkish friends to ensure that NATO remains the supreme uh, defense posture for our continent. And the reason I say that, and I speak as somebody who has a, a sister who works for the European Commission, and she's quite open with me about it. They want to create a supranational state with one country, one foreign policy, of one cent, that's, that's the division bell. Uh, one, one currency, one foreign policy, and all the other attributes that are essential for the creation of an artificial supranational state. And of course, one of the most important planks of that is a common defense force. And there are many people um, who she has introduced me to in the European Commission and the European Parliament who are quite open about it. They say, do you know what they say to us? They say, we can't trust the British and the Americans to look after us. We need to create our own European army. I can't imagine anything that would be more dangerous and destabilizing for our continent. And now, there, as you know, there are six countries inextricably linked to the common defense of our continent that are not members of the European Union and never will be. America, Canada, Iceland, Norway, Britain, and Turkey. And I very much hope that we can work together as countries to ensure that we maintain NATO as the supreme defense posture, rather than allowing this move to undermine NATO, which has done what it says on the tin for the last 70 years, common defense posture that hasn't lost a square inch of territory since its inception 70 years ago. Now, the last thing I'd like to say is that I, feel that the way Turkey has been treated by the European Union, I've written the word here appalled, and I don't think that that is, I, I wouldn't withdraw that word. I'm appalled at the way Turkey has been treated by the European Union. And coming from Poland and speaking the Polish language, I know, understand about the huge amount of misinformation that takes place in the European Parliament about the country of my birth, Poland. Um, and I have every confidence in Turkey and in our partnership with Turks. And I very much hope that what we can do now in the post-Brexit context, context is to create an alternative platform to the European Union in our region for countries that want to trade with one another, 
want to be part of a common, common defense posture, but they want to maintain their sovereignty, identity, currency, and independence. We already have UK, we have Norway, we have Iceland, we have Turkey, we have Switzerland, and others. And why should we have a one-size-fits-all monopolistic system on our continent without any challenge to it? As a conservative, I believe in competition. I think the European Union needs to be held to account, and there needs to be an alternative platform so that the people of any of these countries can make a decision for themselves which one of these two camps one would want to join. If you want to abandon your sovereignty and join the European Union, great. If your own people ratify that in a referendum, fine. But there must always be an alternative to that. I'm very proud that Britain is leading the way. I very much hope that our Turkish friends and allies will join us in due course in establishing that new alternative to the European Union. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Daniel. We'll let you go and vote if you need to go and vote as well. I, um, I, because of this, you know, I've got a proxy vote, so somebody's going for me. It's so almost as good as the House of Lords where we can vote on our phones at home, which is even uh, better. So thank you very much for that. And that was a really interesting political vision of the future of Britain and Turkey. And it now gives me great pleasure to turn to Sir Dominic Chilcott, who, of course, has been ambassador to Turkey now for just over three years, literally just over three years, I think I'm right in saying, um, and to ask you to give the diplomatic vision of the future of British and Turkey relations post-Brexit. Thank you, Dominic. Thanks, uh, Lord Lieutenant. And um, just to reassure you... In, um, we can't yeah. hear you very well. Ah, um, what can I do about that? Uh, is that any better? Can you hear me now? Am I no. Not really. Very quiet. Yeah. Let's see what I can do. Um, 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 um. What I might do, I might uh, uh, leave and rejoin. See if that. Yes. Okay. You might want to go into Yaprak then. Okay, I'll move on to Yaprak and then give you time to come back on. That'd be great. Um, and it's a great pleasure as well. Go, going, we were going to go from the political to the diplomatic uh, to the academic, but now we're going straight from the political to the academic. Um, and it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Yaprit Garzoi here with us this evening. And she is one of the leading academics um, on Turkish relations and comparative politics um, in the UK. And we're delighted to have her from St. Anthony's College uh, Oxford this evening. So, Yaprak, I know you've got a presentation ready, so um, yes. fire away. Yes. Okay, uh, let's see if this works. Can it's you working. hear me? And yes, can you see the presentation? Oh, good. Fantastic. All, good. all right, great. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to the Historical Foundation for organizing this event and inviting me uh, to speak among such distinguished uh, guests and uh, speakers. Um, so I would like to start my words by saying that cooperation beyond trade is obviously possible, as we have seen with the swift signing of the new uh, fr um, free trade agreement, um, which secured bilateral trade and which guaranteed the continuation of uh, what we already had, and which also promises more in the area of trade. And it is certainly desirable uh, to have cooperation beyond uh, trade because of all uh, our common interests and um, the changing international alliances and new global concerns, COVID-19 just being one of them. But what I would like to speak about is uh, what will be the historical and political basis for these new areas of cooperation and what will be the uh, challenges. In order to answer these questions, I would like to talk about perceptions, perceptions of the UK in Turkey predom predominantly, and also just a bit about um, perceptions of Turkey um, in the UK. So the uh, research um, that I'm going to present is uh, a research um, that I collected, uh, data that I collected from interviews and Turkish parliamentary and newspaper uh, archives. 
Um, this is from a project that was funded by the British Institute at Ankara. And some of the figures that I will use uh, have already been published. So if you're interested, I will be happy to send uh, the figures and the publications as well. So obviously there's a lot of goodwill on both sides. Um, so when you speak with uh, politicians, business people and diplomats, or if you look at newspaper um, you know, archives, over the years, uh, you can see uh, the existence of this goodwill on both sides. So for instance, um, the country's leaderships uh, refer to each other as strategic partners. Um, so this is more than an alliance. This is not, this is not just a mere alliance, but a strategic uh, partnership. This comes uh, from, um, as I've heard uh, in my interviews with uh, political people and business people and diplomats as well, this comes from this understanding, this concept of strategic partnership comes from mutual respect and mutual recognition which is reflected in the shared experiences as past empires, uh, as big empires that can understand each other because of historical legacies, and also a shared ambivalence towards uh, the EU and um, Europe. However, these perceptions are expressed in interviews or in official meetings. Um, so they can be superficial, concealing differences between groups, or they might be also concealing uh, complex dynamics or complex perceptions or complex, even there I say, emotions when it comes to um, relations. Indeed, my research in Turkish parliamentary archives uh, suggest uh, that uh, the uh, perceptions are more complex than what we would um, normally believe just looking at these official statements and declarations. So I did research in the Turkish parliamentary archives covering uh, seven years between uh, 2011 and 2018. And we had uh, nearly 900 sessions of the parliament in those seven years. And the UK was mentioned uh, relatively frequently in these parliamentary spe uh, speeches of uh, MPs. Um, so I um, was able to segment the uh, uh, paragraphs or the speeches that the UK was mentioned, and uh, I had a total uh, of uh, more than 1,200 segments. So I coded these uh, perceptions and issues using a methodology of content analysis. I'm not going to bore you with academic details, don't worry. But what I would like to show you um, is um, a simple uh, 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 figure of these perceptions of the UK in the Turkish National Assembly uh, speeches. So this covers the seven um, years. Again, there is a lot of um, detail that I can share, but because time is limited, I'm going to be rather uh, quick. So if you look at the frequencies of coded segments, um, just a couple of important things to mention. First, uh, the, uh, uh, the concept of partnership appears uh, only in 5% uh, of these speeches. So despite all this uh, rhetoric in the official documents and in, um, you know, uh, in the speeches of uh, political leaders, uh, MPs do not necessarily refer to the UK as a partner. But there are positive perceptions, um, and the UK has actually been referred in um, the Turkish National Assembly speeches as a positive model, especially as a positive model with its democracy, with its uh, government, with its uh, politics, uh, with um, also its economy. The, those are the two major areas where uh, Turkish MPs uh, have, have seen the UK as a positive model. And today we can also include, uh, you know, the Brexit deal um, as a positive model as well. Throughout the Brexit negotiations, I've heard many Turkish people saying that maybe what the UK agrees with the EU can also be a model for us, even if it's not a model. Um, the way that Turkey has been treated by the EU at least gives some sort of relief now to the Turkish public and to the Turkish elite that they weren't alone and that by not joining the EU, they're not necessarily missing out uh, something because a big country like the UK has made the decision uh, to um, leave the EU. 
but there are also negative perceptions. And those are, I think, very important technology. For instance, in the uh, coded uh, segments, we see that 25% uh, of the time, the UK was referred to as an enemy. And this is apparent when especially historical, um, uh, historical details are being uh, mentioned um, in uh, parliamentary speeches. So we have the experience of the First World War. We have the experience of uh, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Um, the, and these kind of uh, get repeated in parliamentary uh, speeches and the UK is referred to as an enemy. But we also have potential conflicts of interest mentioned with regards uh, to foreign policy and international relations. Uh, for instance, um, Minister Zabek has mentioned cooperation partnership in Africa, in uh, the Middle East, but we do encounter uh, situations where uh, political leaders refer to the UK um, as an aggressive global actor in these areas, uh, where maybe interests would not necessarily uh, coincide. So we have, uh, for instance, uh, references to the UK as an imperialist power, as a colonial power that uh, messes up things um, in uh, Turkey's neighborhood. These are not the only perceptions, obviously, as you can see that positive perceptions are more dominant, but then it is important to recognize these negative perceptions as well. And these are not necessarily trivial, right? Because if you look at public opinion surveys as well, which country or countries pose threats to Turkey? The answer to that question, this is uh, from two uh, 2019, and it was from a public opinion survey that was conducted by Kadir House University. You say that the United, you see that the United Kingdom is the fourth uh, most frequently mentioned country as a threat to Turkey. Here is another um, a survey uh, from November 2019 conducted by Conda. They were very kind uh, to insert this question uh, for me and for my research. So we uh, gave um, the respondents, these are of course representative samples, right? So they, we can assume that they reflect Turkish public opinion in general. So we gave this quote, political, military and economic relations with Britain should be strengthened. And as you can see, the majority uh, of the respondents and so the majority of the public believes um, that this wouldn't necessarily be a good idea. It is only a minority that would agree with this statement. Again, this needs to be acknowledged. But in public opinion surveys, not all is negative. So here is an interesting um, result from May 2016. Uh, it's a public opinion survey, again, conducted by Conda. So uh, respondents were asked if the UK and Turkey were both EU members, meaning that they, there were no you know, issues with settlement visa, whatever. Would you consider moving to the UK? And 16% said yes. Now, you might think, well, 16% is not too much, you know, 82% said no, but if you think about it, it's a lot. So 16% of people um, uh, envisioned moving to the UK, um, uh, leaving their own um, uh, country, country of uh, birth and country of origin. So what this suggests to me is I like in the national parliamentary um, speeches, now, that there is this negative, you know, um, the UK is possibly a threat to Turkish interest, but at the same time, this modeling of um, the UK lifestyle with its economy, with its uh, politics, uh, so that the Turkish public can see itself having a better life um, in a country like the UK. And then there are dual perceptions of Turkey in the UK too. Uh, because I don't want to run out of time, I'm going to be rather quick with this. And I think that uh, you know um, our uh, distinguished guests can um, explain this uh, better than I do. Uh, but uh, we know the tourist numbers. Uh, leading countries visited by residents of the United Kingdom in 2019. Turkey is in top 10. So when it comes to tourism, for instance, Turkey is a very good destination uh, for um, uh, United Kingdom residents. Um, this is important because aside from the USA, all of the other countries in the top 10 are EU members. Uh, so for Turkey to attract this much uh, tourism suggests that Turkey is in fact as a, is an attraction uh, of uh, some sort. So the, that can be perceived as a positive um, uh, perception, positive perception toward uh, Turkey. But we have also unfortunately uh, witnessed um, scaremongering during the Brexit uh, referendum. This is a poster that is going to be familiar to um, a lot of people. 
Uh, so uh, we, we see this type of stereotyping of uh, Turkey and Turkish immigrants or uh, Muslim immigrants uh, through Turkey. Uh, I think this has happened because among the public, it's not necessarily political leadership or political parties that are on the fringe, but because in public opinion, even if it's a minority, there is this possibility of viewing uh, Turkey neg negatively and from a very stereotypical uh, point of view. So we have, for instance, the UK media coverage of migration in reference to countries during the EU referendum campaign. And the data is quite interesting that Turkey was mentioned more um, than uh, countries uh, that, uh, you know, um, that, that, that give uh, immigrants uh, to the UK uh, uh, within the European Union. Uh, so Turkey was mentioned more frequently than Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, etc. So what this all means is that and in some, uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that um, historical and political basis for future and more substantial cooperation exist. So we have positive perceptions as a result of shared experiences, mutual respect, and in the case of Turkey, a modeling, viewing the UK as a positive model. This can be also interpreted as the UK soft power in Turkey, and that is certainly very important, needs to be acknowledged. And we can see uh, the examples of these positive perceptions reflected in official statements, the new foreign trade agreement, and of course, uh, you know, the goodwill that has been, uh, uh, you know, shown um, from, from, uh, from both sides. But there are also pitfalls and there's historical animosity and stereotypes and these can creep up and endanger uh, future cooperation and this is I think where we need to be cautious. So rather than you know talking about what kind of a shape this future cooperation can um, uh, contain or what, what it can look like, I would like to st stress that whatever shape it takes, it needs to build on the positive perceptions while taking into account uh, the negatives. Uh, we should include um, in the, any such cooperation a long-term strategy to dismantle these negative perceptions. It will take generations. It's not going to be easy, but we need to um, you know, strive for it and it's never too late because stability of deeper cooperation would depend on the ability to change these negative perceptions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yaprak. I mean, that was really enlightening um, and coming from an empirical research base, I think, was especially relevant to what we all might say and um, certainly made me reflect on the words that I used at the beginning and uh, how, how far those words like partnership and collaboration actually mean and how deep they go. So that, that was really helpful. Thank you. And Thank I'm sure you. we'll have you. some tough questions asked on the numbers later on. Um, so, Dominic, I don't know if we're up and going now. No, I can't hear you at all. It's worse. Is that any good? Is that That's better? perfect. We've got you. Ah, very interesting. Okay. It seems to be my headphones were interfering. Okay. Okay, good. Right. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much to the Circle Foundation for inviting me. Uh, I should reassure you that I was here from the outset, a little bit before the outset, but I think um, I managed to enter as a member of the audience rather than a member of the panel. So I was in the waiting room and um, I put my hand up and got identified, but I, so I have heard everything that's gone on so far, so please rest assured on that. I'm sorry I missed part of Yaprak's uh, presentation uh, when I was rebooting my computer, but it sounded absolutely fascinating, if rather sobering to know that actually quite a lot, there's quite a lot of historical baggage. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not always historical. Maybe, it's, um, maybe it is convenient sometimes to, uh, to point the finger at certain countries to uh, blame what's going on in the region or in the country on outside powers. And actually it's a reflection of the, of the powerful uh, perception of the UK, or the UK is a, a powerful actor that, that we, are, you know, we get so much of the, um, the negative uh, reputation as well. Anyway, it's not my, I think it's not my business at the moment to comment on that too much. I did want to say a few things though about the juncture that we find ourselves in. Um, because I think the UK leaving the European Union is highly significant for our international relations. I mean, we spent 47 years, as Mr. Kosinski was saying, kind of uh, slowly but surely aligning 
our international activities with the, those of the European Union. And uh, now we don't have to do that anymore. And we have to charter our own course. And um, I think that's probably as big a change as the kind of loss of empire was in the, in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. so we had a policy that was built around empire. And then we had to find a new role in the world, as Dean Acheson famously said. Um, and I think in a way, we're at that point now in the UK. And as people will know, the government, the British government, um, has um, uh, it's, uh, it's organized an integrated review of all those aspects of uh, government activity and, and private sector activity, which is international. So our diplomacy, our development assistance, our military powers, our soft powers, our other areas where we're active internationally to see how that can be better kind of combined to greater effect and uh, what it, and where it should be used, where, where are our priorities uh, for the future. Now, unfortunately, the integrated review hasn't yet been published. <laughs> so, well, I'm not sure exactly what it's going to be recommended. So, but um, I think that is one of the uncertainties at the moment as we find our new place in the world and our new role in the world um, as a kind of medium sized but rather influential uh, power outside any of the big blocks um, outside the European Union, outside the big trading blocks at least. And um, I thought it might be helpful just to uh, outline a, a few of the challenges that the UK faces internationally. Um, and that might then provide a kind of context in which to look at British-Turkish cooperation. So I think some of the most immediate and important challenges, obviously we start with the public health challenge of the COVID pandemic and the um, Prime Minister's efforts uh, to uh, be better prepared for future pandemics as we expect there will be future ones. I think secondly, uh, the economic recovery in the UK um, from the restrictions imposed uh, by the pandemic upon us um, and that ec economic recovery linked to things like um, keeping open our trade routes, avoiding protectionism, um, uh, building on the strengths of the, of the UK economy, uh, particularly in areas like life sciences and high tech and in the services area. Then I think the third really big change, which is a slower burning change, but um, is very important this year for the UK is about the climate. We are hosting the COP26 meeting in November in Glasgow and trying to galvanize international efforts to be more ambitious on greenhouse gas reductions is a major objective for the UK this year. Fourthly, I think it's in, even more than ever in the UK's interest now that we're, as it were, an independent country uh, in the global system to have a strong rules-based system in place to preserve uh, peace and stability. And I think upholding and reinforcing the rules-based international system is going to be, a, I think, an ongoing uh, priority for the UK as far as one can see. And then the fifth thing I would say is there are a whole set of national security issues which don't go away whether you're in the EU or not in the EU, but they are a bit different when you're not in the EU. Things like the uh, counter-terrorism uh, efforts, our efforts to deal with irregular migration, uh, with serious organized crime, as well as of course, our collective defense uh, in NATO. So I think those are all very important. And I suppose the issue is, you know, how does the UK respond to those priorities? It's pretty clear we can't do this on our own. We need friends and partners, if I may use the word still, and allies um, in this endeavor. And um, if you look around the world, I think as the UK, you want to have countries close to you that are strategically, strategically aligned, that sort of share the same values and believe in democracy and all of that, and that are powerful economies, powerful trading nations, um, and have uh, you know, real regional reach um, and aren't on the other side of the planet as well, are sort of fairly near to you. And I think if you look at Turkey, it ticks all those boxes because we're strategically aligned with NATO, as NATO allies. Uh, we're both founder members of the Council of Europe, which says something about our values and adherence to democracy. We're both G20 economies, which means we're both powerful trading uh, nations. And, um, uh, you know, Turkey is increasingly uh, a very influential regional power. Uh, in, uh, in that part of the world. Um, and that part of the world is not so very far away from the UK. It's not as though we're talking about Indonesia or um, you know, places in the Far East. We're talking about a country that rather like the UK um, is on the fringes of uh, the continent of Europe, 
and like the UK is not inside the European Union, but has to deal with living as a neighbor uh, or having as a neighbor this behemoth, this enormous uh, European Union organization next to us, which constantly will pose the challenge of to what extent do we align with what the European Union is doing and to what extent do we do things differently in our own national interests. So I think in a funny way, that is another point in common with Turkey, which will create a sense of common ground between us that we're that we are both, you know, also former imperial powers with, um, you know, with big international ambitions, but not in the not in the European Union. Um, so uh, I want to uh, pick up a couple of things where uh, we can see cooperation already happening and where it could develop further. Um, as uh, Mr. Zebecci said, um, you know, the the uh, uh, free trade agreement that we reached just at the end of last year is a very important uh, document because it safeguards the trade that we have at the moment, over 90% of which has been or was uh, sort of manufactured goods passing through the customs union. We've stepped out of the customs union and if we hadn't had a trade agreement to replace the benefits of being inside the customs union, um, a lot of our uh, 21 billion dollars, 18 billion pounds, uh, worth of trade would have been under a huge competitive pressure from other countries. But actually, by having the free trade agreement, we have provided for a large degree of continuity uh, that will benefit our companies in Turkey and, and in the UK. And that trade that we have had grown 70% in the last 10 years. So even continuity, outside the peculiar time of COVID, even continuity suggests that actually, you know, if one maintains the pre-COVID trend, there are good grounds for being hopeful that we can continue to build a trading relationship between us based on past performance. But the free trade agreement contained within it, critically, um, an article which looked forward to us going beyond continuity and negotiating a comprehensive free trade agreement that would cover areas which are not in the existing free trade agreement, mm -hmm. namely, things like fresh agricultural produce, of which Turkey is a powerhouse producer, services, where the UK is kind of second to none in, our, in the development of our service industry, in the digital area, which Mr. Zebekci has already mentioned, which is very important for the future, and possibly also in areas like public procurement. So if we succeed, and we are committed to beginning a negotiation on this comprehensive FTA within two years, if we succeed, uh, in um, having a comprehensive free trade agreement between us, then I think the potential for that trade to expand rapidly, even beyond the trends that we've established in the last few years is there. And um, that's the reason for, for, for being very hopeful. And that would include, I think, as we got to know each other better, that would include work in third countries. And I completely agree that places like Africa or indeed Central Asia, but maybe more particularly Africa, are very fertile ground for for example, Turkish construction companies mm -hmm. and British service services to be working together with British finance through our UK export finance uh, um, organization to work together to, uh, to our mutual benefit. So I look forward to more and more of that happening as well. Second area to mention very briefly is in the area of national security, mm -hmm. where I agree with everybody uh, who has said so far that uh, Turkey is underappreciated by the Europeans generally for doing our dirty work for us. I, I mean, in the Cold War, it was, I think it was pretty obvious that you know, this, uh, NATO's southeastern flank was guarded by Turkey, just as our north, uh, northeastern flank or our northern flank was guarded by Norway. But what is uh, maybe not as apparent to public opinion these days is that actually Turkey is the last stable democracy as you head east. So once you're beyond Turkey, you're into Iran, Iraq and Syria immediately. And, um, and Azerbaijan uh, and, the, and the Caucasus. And don't say anything uh, critical about the, the, the Caucasus particularly, but there is that sort of arc of instability, which is on, on Turkey's immediate borders, on Turkey's immediate Southern borders, and which Turkey is able to absorb a lot of that instability. Uh, and by doing so, acts still as the sort of protector of the European continent. And um, I also join those who've paid tribute to Turkey hosting so many um, refugees from Syria. And uh, what is not said often enough, but should be said, is that the Turkish military presence inside northwest Syria is preventing a humanitarian catastrophe 
um, because it's, it's deterring the regime from a final assault on the last bit of Syria in which the opposition still, uh, as it were, organize themselves. And uh, if that assault were to happen, there are some 3 million people in Idlib, uh, one dreads to think what the consequences for them would be. So it's not only protecting the lives of those Syrians who made it into Turkey, but it's protecting at least 3 million Syrians inside Syria. Uh, and the consequences of even greater instability in Syria would be felt not just in Turkey, but right across the European continent, as we saw briefly in 2015, when we, we remember the television pictures of, of lines and lines of people trying to cross Europe to go to Germany or to other places. And Turkey also, as well as that, it protects us, uh, or it helps us protect ourselves on counterterrorism. I mean, Turkey is on the front line of where ISIL was in Northeast Syria. Um, and our cooperation with Turkey on counterterrorism is beneficial to us and very much in our national interest that we should continue that, as is our cooperation on serious and organized crime. So I think there are two areas there. They're going to remain extremely important. Um, I don't know at the moment, as I speak, whether being outside the European Union is going to help us increase our cooperation in those areas because the mechanics of it, um, I'm not sure yet how they, how they will change as we go forward. But I think if we have the goodwill generated by uh, wanting to work with Turkey as a cooperative friend and partner, particularly on trade, then I think there will be benefits that are not restricted to trade that will enable the cooperation in other areas to become more natural and more instinctive. And I think that is a, um, a realistic and potential future uh, for us as well. So on that note, I, and there is more that one can say obviously on the subject, but I, I think I've probably used up my 10 minutes and thank you very much for giving me this platform. No, thank you very much. And that was um, a very good, um, I think, uh, distillation of where we had gone with the other speakers and the commonality between the UK and Turkey and the future collaboration the two global countries can look forward to. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm now going to open up for questions. We've got a high number of questions. We've got about 20 minutes. So I'm going to try my best to group the questions and by topic and ask a couple of the panel to respond to each one. And then we might have a chance of getting through um, as many as we can. So the first question, which I am going to um, ask Daniel and um, former Minister Zabeci to answer is really about the EU deal. Um, and it's in response to Aaron and Zerkin's question. And first of all, to Daniel, what do you think uh, the EU deal means to the UK? And secondly, to uh, Minister Zabeci, what do you think it means for Turkey? And what, what do you want to see come out of the further, more comprehensive uh, free trade deal that we've already heard Dominic refer to? So, Mr. Zabeci, if you'd like to go first. First, let me, tell, let me thank to Mr. Ambassador. I'm really very happy to see such an uh, ambassador to know the, all the subjects and looking very positive and well understand, well understood the very comprehensive FTA between Turkey and the UK. Uh, The FTA between Turkey and the UK will be very comprehensive I and mean, much, much better than the or trade capacity when the UK was in the EU. It was limited, as I said, it was limited with the customs union, which we uh, signed uh, 20, I think 25, 26 years ago with the European Union, only with the industrial goods. Now the FTA between UK and the Turkey as the Mr. Ambassador said, uh, including services, including agricultural goods, include, including the public procurements, public, uh, even in the e-trade and go on. And the, 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 it is very easy, you know, the uh, customs union between Turkey and the European Union, it became impossible to modernize it, improve uh, or upgrade this 
the agreement is almost impossible. When I was the minister, I mean, the two years we negotiated from 2014 until end of 2016, we came to the conclusion, European uh, Committee, Commission, the, the unanimously, they sent the, uh, the, this to the, the European uh, the Council, then ele ele elections started in 2017, and it went off again. But the, the FTA between Turkey and the Euro UK is not, nothing to do like this, because it's just very free countries with, with bilateral uh, F FTA. Uh, when, whenever it need it, we can sit and negotiate and improve it. We can enlarge it. We can the, 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 create the other op opportunities. Uh, we can establish, we can upgrade it. We can improve the, this, uh, this FTA very, very easily. That's why the, uh, this FTA is going to create very imp important opportunities between two countries. One thing I forgot to mention is, you know, the the, the cooperation opportunities like construction, like other areas, energy. Mm -hmm. You know, UK is, has very important experience offshore uh, carbon sources, uh, improving the carbon sources, also uh, renewable energy technologies. UK has very good experience. Now the, the, the Turkey and the UK in, in, in the Black Sea, in the in the in the, in the Mediterranean or in the other countries, in the third countries, the, the Turkey and the, the UK can cooperate also with the energy technologies. Thank you. Well, that's very a very good point in energy as well. Uh, Daniel, would you like to just talk about the EU deal from a British perspective? Well, yes, very quickly. I think I mean what's fascinating about Europe is just how how it's shrinking um, as a percentage of global output and global population. Uh, I think even the uh, European Commission has uh, published some data a few weeks ago whereby the prognosis as to how much the European Union is going to contribute to global output uh, between now and 2030 or 2040 uh, is shrinking uh, beyond even their own expectations. And so to be shackled up in such a profound way to a netty which is shrinking and becoming less and less important on the global stage is not something in British interests. What Liz Truss has been telling us about this evening, of course, is that we want to join the CPTPP, the Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Partnership, which is actually larger than the European Union, uh, with a larger population, and it's growing uh, as a percentage of global uh, GDP and population. And if countries like Japan and others sensibly are prepared and willing for the United Kingdom to join this extraordinary uh, block uh, based around the Pacific, despite the fact that geographically speaking, uh, we're not part of that region, then I think we should jump at it with both feet because it allows us to trade, which is what we have always wanted to do, with a minimum of disruption and tariffs, whilst protecting and maintaining our own internal judicial processes and legislative framework. Um, let's not forget also one important thing. We have handed, according to the House of Commons Library, uh, I think we've handed over somewhere in the region 570 billion pounds net to the European Union since we joined. Net. Now, as a member of Parliament, I have to tell, tell you that uh, I can take you to schools in my constituency with leaking roofs and poor insulation where they're making cutbacks to teaching assistants. I can take you to my local hospital where you will still find people on trolleys in corridors, peak winter times, because there are not enough beds for them. And yet we're handing over to the European Union this year alone, 17 billion pounds in the transition period, money which we don't have. Now, and yet we have a trade deficit with them of 92 billion pounds a year. Our single biggest trading partner as a single country entity, the United States of America, we pay them nothing 
to trade with them, zero pence, and yet we have a trade surplus with them of 63 billion pounds a year. When I first became a member of Parliament 15 years ago, we were ex exporting 50% of all products to the European Union. That figure today is 40%. So over the last 15%, we've seen a one percentage point decline of British exports of the European Union as a percent of all British exports. That trajectory accentuates the point that I've been trying to make, which is we shouldn't be so st structurally tied to one small grouping, and we should be seeking to expand our interests around the world, be that in the Pacific, be that all to the Commonwealth countries uh, and beyond. And the last thing which is so exciting is that we are leaving a protectionist racket, a protectionist racket designed to protect inefficient industries on our continent. And I'll give you a classic example. Coffee. Something we drink most days, all of us. No tariffs for coffee beans. No tariffs for coffee beans. Why? Because no European Union country can grow coffee. Massive tariffs for roasted coffee designed to protect the inefficient coffee roasting industries of Germany and Italy. I would rather buy my roaster coffee directly from the Kenyans. I would rather create a set of, set of circumstances that whereby the Kenyans can have the value add, the real money comes not from growing the coffee beans. The real money comes from roasting the coffee beans, the processing industries that are involved. I would rather buy, rather than giving the Kenyans and others crumbs off our table. And by the way, we're very proud of the fact give 17 billion pounds a year of British taxpayers' money in overseas aid. But rather than giving them the crumbs on our table, I would rather give them tariff-free or low-tariff access to the fifth largest economy in the world. And now that we are out of the European Union, I think you will find a revolution uh, when it comes to how the United Kingdom is dealing with tariffs making sure that the things that we can't produce or grow ourselves uh, do not come, ag come across those massive trade barriers that the European Union, those massive protectionist policies the European Union uh, has put for all countries that are members of the European Union. Thank you. And one of the ways, I guess, in the next sort of couple of questions, one of the ways in which uh, Britain can reach out is, is of course, through a free flowing of people. Um, and it's something that Yaprak referred to in her presentation in terms of the number of people who wanted to come to the UK. And I just wanted to ask Yaprak and indeed Dominic, um, how you see the future of visa relations between the UK um, and Turkey? And I know this has been a subject of a great deal of excitement, especially during COVID, where some people who had visas could not renew them, for example, in the UK because they couldn't physically come to the UK. And how do you think, first of all, Yaprak, how that, that relationship can be um, increased and developed so that there is a free flow of people and what organisations as well as business could encourage that, perhaps higher education and everything else, and maybe don't Dominic, if you could just update us on where we are with visa um, arrangements post -an the Ankara Agreement, that'd be great. So, yeah, Prak first. Yeah, I think uh, it would be very important uh, for Turkish businesses, for Turkish uh, students, as well as uh, Turkish tourists uh, to be able to come to the UK uh, without a visa. Um, I mean, there are uh, interest-based, you know, practical reasons for supporting uh, visa-free travel, but then the symbolic value of this would be, I think, uh, very high as well. Um, you know, uh, when the uh, Turkish public views the UK as a potential threat, for instance, you know, uh, being uh, allowed to travel to the UK without a visa, would have that symbolic value of thinking, hmm, maybe, you know, we weren't quite right. Um, because 
I think the perception uh, in the Turkish public is that somehow that they are being stereotyped uh, by uh, the Europeans, by the Westerners uh, for some reason, and being able to see that they're not being stereotyped as an immigrant, as a potential danger, would then change their own perceptions as well. Um, so uh, for practical reasons too, I mean, we know uh, from studies uh, on, for instance, uh, soft power that people who um, do business uh, in a foreign country and uh, have business cooperation or who uh, study in a foreign country also have positive perceptions of that country as well. And they want to cooperate more, they want to come more, and they, you know, um, they want to do more business with these countries. So it, it, the more you increase interactions, people to people interactions, uh, the more positive perceptions you can generate. And that can only be, be, be possible in the current context um, through visa liberalization. And uh, so I would say that it is an absolute must if we are going to move forward. But whether uh, that kind of um, policy uh, would be uh, something that the UK would be able to deliver uh, for their own internal reasons as well. And of course, from the Turkish side, there's this uh, perception well, that the Turkish, Turks are going to migrate uh, to the UK, whether that is something that can be, uh, you know, um, sold, if you know what I mean, uh, to the public. And uh, that is something that I cannot answer. And uh, perhaps uh, uh, Mr. Chilcott uh, can answer that question, <laughs> where we stand in terms of this uh, policy and whether it is possible. Uh, shall I go now? Yes, um, please, sorry. Um, right. Well, I think that I think one must distinguish between short term visit visas mm -hmm. and employment visas. And um, on the latter, on employment visas or visas for work, um, as uh, you may know, the UK has taken the decision that it's going to move to an Australian style points based system where what's going to matter in, from now on is not where you come from, but what skills and experience you're able to bring to the UK labour market. So in the future, and I think this is good news for Turkish people, in the future, um, a Turkish person will be judged for an employment visa on the same basis as a German or an American or an Australian or a French person. So um, that's a completely level playing field for mm -hmm. Turkey. The difficulty for Turkey is that uh, for people who, many people who wanted to come to the UK as either low paid or lower skilled workers, that route is pretty much closed off now around the world mm -hmm. so that we won't be taking in um, low paid um, uh, immigrants for work uh, or, uh, or low skilled uh, immigrants uh, for the time being at least. So, um, but it does mean that if you're a university graduate in Turkey uh, that you have the right experience and uh, the right educational qualifications and your English language skills are good then um, you will not be prejudiced in any way because you come from Turkey when you're being judged against somebody from any other country. And I think that where this works in Turkey's favor, and this is a bit of speculation, but I think there's something in it, is that inevitably the proportion of uh, people getting work permits in the UK that comes from the European Union will decrease in the future on the basis of a level playing field because there will be no automatic right to come to the UK to find work. Now we're not in the EU. And the countries that should benefit are countries with good education systems, uh, which are not that far away from the UK, so that it's not a huge leap of imagination for people to see their futures, or at least their work, their, some of their working life uh, in the UK. So I think countries like Turkey, um, uh, actually are quite well placed to take advantage of the, uh, the new system. Although I'm not encouraging a brain drain out of Turkey either, because I mean, mm -hmm. no, Turkey exactly. needs well-qualified, um, uh, you know, good people with the right experience uh, as well. That's the first thing to say on working uh, uh, visas. Um, on short-term visit visas, uh, as a matter of kind of principle, we don't like short-term visit visas because um, they're expensive to operations, uh, they cause extra friction in the, you know, in the movement of people. And we only have short-term visit visas uh, for countries where there is a track record 
of people coming into the country and not abiding by the visa rules. So um, when I was first in Turkey as a young diplomat in the 1980s, there were no short-term visit visas uh, required for uh, visitors from Turkey to the UK, but they were introduced when a large number of uh, Turkish people uh, saying they were going on holiday actually ended up overstaying, looking for work mm -hmm. or trying to settle down in the UK. So the only way to stop it was to have a visa regime. And I'm afraid to say that it is still the case that in terms of countries that produce the most people that disobey the visa terms on which they enter the UK, I'm afraid Turkey is still one of the top countries uh, for those problems. So while that is the case, I don't see any prospect of short-term visit visas being removed for Turkey, unfortunately. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, very Daniel, quickly. Can can, just one quick point. I just wanted to eventuate to our Turkish friends, uh, again, at the point His Excellency, our ambassador, has just made, although in a slightly more provocative way, if I may. Um, what I find amazing, I've spoken to many students in my constituency, many young students would not accept or understand just how racist uh, the immigration policy has been over the last decades. Can you imagine two countries side by side, Bulgaria and Turkey? The Bulgarians are the two, immediate access to the United Kingdom, all of our welfare system, all of our job opportunities, but not for Turks. How on earth can you differentiate between Bulgarians and Turks on purely on the basis that they are either Bulgarian or Turkish? And I am so proud of the fact now, as the ambassador said, that in the post-Brexit context, we will assess you, not whether you are Bulgarian or Turkish, which is racist. We will, I'm not interested in the color of your skin, in your religion, in your background or anything else. I'm interested in the skills that as an immigrant, you're going to bring to the United Kingdom. And I speak as an immigrant to this country myself, very, very proud that unlike other European countries, we are leaving this racist system behind us and we will treat people based on their skills rather than their country origin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got time for just one more question, which I think will go to Mr Zabecci. And it is, whilst the UK has left the EU, um, obviously President Erdogan made la only last week, I think, um, a speech to the EU about building and helping relations in relation to what's been happening with Greece and France over the last period of time. And I would just be interested in your perspective on where you think Turkey's relationship with the EU will go post having seen the UK leave the EU. Do you think that will change the dynamic between Turkey and the EU or we will, will we see a continuation of the current relationship? Phone. <clears throat> okay. Yes, yeah. Thank, thanks a lot, you, His Excellency, Mr. Ambassador. Very open, very brief, and frankly, sad. And also that the, the, the MP Kauczynski, is that, did I say it right or not? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot. Very Whatever good. Whatever you said, you know, the, the things which, which we couldn't say, we, we could, we, we, you, you, you really translate our feelings uh, on the table. We, uh, Lord Mark, you know, the, the, the Turkey is the candidate to European Union exactly the same as my age, almost 60 years. We have relation with the European Union, you know, we are, it's a kind of hopeless love. When I start the negotiations upgrading the customs union between Turkey and European Union, I said to my counterpart, as a minister of economy, I don't believe that Turkey is going to be the member of the European Union. But the, 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 I mean, I don't care honestly. But what I care is to 
reach the standards of the European Union in the technology, in education, in human rights, in the democracies, in, 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 in all. This is, let's say, these this two things are different. You know, when Turkey is going to be the full member of the European Union, when the day comes, European Union needs the Turkey more than the Turkey needs European Union, then we can say, okay, it will happen. But the, 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 the relation between Turkey and European Union, really, the, 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 I, I really thanks to the uh, MP Kauczynski, mm -hmm. the, the, what the, the region of Turkey, we have hundreds of threads which you can never imagine all around. I mean, the, all, all the terrorist organizations in the world, they are all the, the, the battlefield around the Turkey. What we did in Syria, most of the countries in European Union, they protest the Turkey to protect our country, to protect the people in Syria, to, 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 to give them the, the the living chance, living standards in Syria. I mean, they, they, you can never compare the they living standards. You cannot imagine what kind of the tortures, what kind of things they lost in Syria. You cannot imagine it. As Turkey, we, we are now the, the hosting more than two, two, three million Syrian people in Turkey. Another three million, four million, we are trying to to keep them in their houses in Syria. These are, you know, the, the, as I don't say them how much money it costs, but the, 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 to protecting or to saving in one human life is, uh, the, you cannot compare, you cannot convert to the, any uh, currency in the world. The, the, and the Turkey is uh, the protecting European Union, protecting the, uh, the modern world, protecting the uh, Western living standards of the European or the, the, the other countries. Turkey is a very good country, a very good boy. Bravo and applause to Turkey. And okay, let's share the other things. No, Turkey is the out of the, 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 uh, the, the table. Now, the, 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 I, I'm, I'm very happy with, the, with the Daniel, with the ambassador, with the others. I mean, the, I think the, the best country in the world can understand the Turkey is the UK. Because they have the experience, they have the background of the region. They know as a country, as an empire, they, they know the region better than the other countries in the world. That's why we can, we, we can cooperate with the UK in the region, in Africa, in the Middle Asia, in the Middle East or in, in, in other countries also, in Europe, also we can cooperate with the UK. You know, maybe you don't know, the Turkey is, has the uh, much better FTA than the customs union with which, which we have the, with the European mm -hmm. Union, EFTA, Switzerland, Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway. We have very uh, comprehensive, very competitive, very, the, the, balanced free trade agreement with these two countries, with, with these four countries, with Turkey, it's five countries. I think that the UK, uh, we, we can meet, we can uh, go, go, we meet with the UK also in EFTA together. And uh, unfortunately with the European Union, uh, if we make a research in Turkey, I think Yaprak can do it, or Yaprak has this kind of information if, if we ask the Turkish people, do you, do you really want to be the, the Turkey one, the member of the European Union? It's less than fifty percent. Mm -hmm. So a big, and a big opportunity. Is, one, one, one day, if, if there is an opportunity to, to, to Turkey, uh, let's say Turkey got the opportunity to be the member of the European Union, we have to take it to referendum, mm -hmm. as the UK, as the UK did. Unfortunately, I'm afraid uh, we can have the we can have the no. Yeah, and that's of course is a matter for Turkey. But I think the key point and that very perceptive point is there is a big opportunity for us to work with Turkey 
build a strong relationship and irrespective of what happens with the EU, be a real friend and partner rather than just one that's superficially um, a friend and partner. And as you said, let's um, Turkey get on with the difficulties in the region and um, says thank you very much, but it doesn't go much further. Um, and I think that's... Difficulty, yeah, difficulty, difficulties brings the opportunities also. Yes. Difficult, because the, I, I don't see any other, any other construction companies, any other companies, trading companies, manufacturing companies, which they can go to Iraq, which they can go mm -hmm. the, the, in, in, in the, the Africa, but all Turkish companies, they can yes. go there easily. Why not with the, with the with British companies? Mm -hmm. as, the, as the MP Daniel Kavcinski said, why not be create our own new block? Mm -hmm. Not the block, not against to anyone. Block to, for to, to for for all for all, all mm -hmm. interests. But a but a global partnership that can work everywhere, and where the two countries bringing out their very best assets can actually be a very formidable force across the world. And I think that's been very much the theme um, throughout this evening. I'd like to begin before I thank the panelists just to properly thank the Circle Foundation for organising this evening, because without organisations like the Circle Foundation expounding and developing links between Turkey and the UK and looking after the Turkish diaspora in the UK, we wouldn't be able to have the kind of conversations that lead us to have such hope and hopefully to deal with some of the misconceptions that certainly Yaprax um, uh, evidence suggested is true just now and that we need real dialogue and um, to overcome any prejudices that are felt either in the UK or people take advantage of in the UK. But I was very struck by Daniel's, you know, 7,600 businesses, um, um, British businesses are doing business in Turkey. And that's 7,600 relationships that have to be developed and which both countries, I think, have an absolute um, demand to ensure that those relationships are nurtured so that um, we can work across the world together and continue to develop post Britain leaving the EU and taking the opportunity of that new geopolitical map across the world and the friendship between Turkey um, and the UK. And really tonight to have had such an excellent panel from the heart of Turkish government, from the House of Commons, from the diplomatic sector and from academia really has managed to bring together, I think, a very full um, and worthwhile conversation about the opportunities that are available for us all in the future. And certainly as chairman of the all party group um, in parliament, I will continue to work with all of you to develop Britain's relationship um, with Turkey. And that's going to be very important in the next five to 10 years. So thank you very much to all of you. And thank you to all of those who tuned in to watch us on Facebook or Zoom this evening. Thank you. Thank you.